Well, praise God, we are here. Hallelujah. Amen. What a blessed res resurrection day, right? Amen. I know some of you have been here a while. We're going to get things started today. If you're able, you can stand and join us. One day when heaven was filled with his graces, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. The word became flesh and the light shined upon his glory revealed Living he loved me Dying he saved me Buried he carried My sins far away Rising he justified Really forever One day he's coming A glorious day A glorious day Up Calvary's mountain One day they nailed him To die on a tree Suffering anguish Despised and rejected Bearing our sins My Redeemer is he The hand that healed nations Stretched out on a tree And took the nails from me Seal him no longer. One day the stone rolled away from the door. Then he arose over death he had conquered. Now has ascended, my Lord evermore. Death could not hold him, the grave could not keep him from rising again.
Good morning and happy Easter. It occurred to me that if Christ hadn't done what we're celebrating today, we would have no hope. Absolutely zero. So thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Okay. This is, uh, if you take your bulletins, we'll go over some... Uh, facts and announcements, but before we do that, I've got a lot of stuff to say about Fifth Sunday missions, and where are we ready for, where's Ron? There he is. Oh, you're going to be the bearer? May we have the presentation of the five, please? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jason. There we are. What a way to go out on the last Sunday, and we just torched it. Okay, um, this is the last Sunday of our fifth Sunday missions month. Our next one will be in June, uh, at which time we'll be honoring... Uh, Randy and Rhonda Elliott, most of you have met them. He's a very large guy that works in the prison in Camp Verde, or the county jail, I should say. And we will be honoring them with our, f our five love offerings that we take during the, during the month. And uh, I just wanted to bring you up to date on where we're at. Um, so far, this month, and surely we'll hold the check another week for those folks we always have some folks, you know, that, that give a, on the last Sunday or during the week. She'll hold that check. But so far, we have raised, for Jessica, $495. A uh, little bit low, which led me to do some missionary math. Okay? Now, this, I know what you're going to say. You know, this is pro probably not going to happen, but I'm just going to throw it out there, okay? I like to be positive. And there's about 63 of us in here today. If 63 of us each gave $12,000 to Jessica, she would come away with $756,000. Okay? In the event that we can't do that for some reason, that pesky $50 bill that's hiding in your wallet, or a $10 bill or a $5 bill, just stick that in an envelope and put it in the offering slot or write a check, however God leads you. Uh, this is coming to her without her knowledge. It's going to be a big surprise. And let me tell you, our missionaries um, can do a lot with that extra money. So, um, let me see. That'll do it for Fifth, fifth Sunday Missions. Man. Okay. Let's go to the back side of our bulletins and take a look at the bulletin board. One thing that's not on there is the men's breakfast. It's the third Saturday uh, of every month. Adult Sunday school resume on April 7th with Pastor Tom uh, taking a walk following the footsteps of Jesus. If you have missed that, you have missed a lot. That takes place in the fellowship hall at 9.30 every Sunday. Man, does Tom White do a great job with that. Uh, it also says we're looking for a couple of folks to help manage prayer requests during the week so that they get out even faster. Please uh, let Pastor John know if you're able to help with that. Um, birthdays and anniversaries are there for you to look at. And... Are there any other announcements that need to be made right now? Anyone? No hands. Okay. Then let's go to prayer requests and praises. If, uh, Jason, you have the mic. Okay. If you have a prayer request or a praise, and there's a hand already, 
Go ahead and offer it up at this time. Where's Jackie? Is she, she's ready. Okay. I want to give a praise and a prayer for my mom. Um, when she took her fall, she did not break anything. She's bruised up pretty bad, so she's home. Um, prayers that she would follow instructions. Um, because she'll feel better if she does. That's as far I'm going with that. <laughs> and then prayers for Fred and I as we leave after church um, to go to Phoenix and fly out tomorrow to see the grandkids in Kauai. Okay, that's going to... We'll be back in two weeks. Okay, that's going to be... A, I know every man, every person has their cross to bear. <laughs> but going to Hawaii to see your family, okay... Just bear up under that, please. Thank you. Anyone else with a request? Jason? Heidi? Um, our really good friend up in Washington passed away at 5 o'clock yesterday. And I'd like to ask for prayers for um, Pam and all of her family, please. And then um, a request for travel mercies. Lex and I are going to get on the road and... Uh, travel around for about 30 days. So travel mercies, please. Mary. I just want to praise God for the peace that he wraps us in at, when we need it and allows it to flow all through us. I want to thank you guys for your love, your prayers, the food, the cards, uh, all through my husband's death. And, and I want to invite you to his celebration of life Saturday, right here, 11 o'clock. Okay, and we want to thank Clayton sitting right there next to Mary. Thank you for being there for the entire family, Clayton. Appreciate that, the grandson. Anything else? Linda. I just want to praise the Lord that um, Ken now is feeling much better after two different procedures. And um, I hope that will continue. And your prayer request, the, you know, the prayers that you guys have given me in support, it's just invaluable. And uh, just knowing that you guys are there, if I ever needed anything, it just uh, takes a big load off of your mind. Anyway, thank you, and um, I just hope and pray that con everything will continue. Back, Pastor. Yeah, I've got a friend whose wife, Deb, is trying to get out of the hospital today. She's been uh, having some medical issues, and they're hoping she gets to come home today. And he uh, actually called and left a message late last night and asked if we would pray for her today. So her name is Deb. You up with that, Jackie? Okay. <laughs> See the smoke coming off your pen there. Anyone else have a prayer request or a praise? Right up front with Diane, Jason. I'll try to get through this. We've had a lot of trauma the last week in our life. One is praise, little Miles. He was born at six pounds, two ounces. They say he wasn't premature, but they're looking into that. He is now able to nurse. He is off oxygen and off of the feeding tube, and that's a big praise. So he is my, I guess, great nephew. So anyway, and then our Sylvia. Thursday morning early. We got a phone call at, it was probably about 1.15. And Robert called, he was at work. Sylvia had called him and said, Dad, go to the house, Sylvia needs you. So I got ready and Jim called me and says, come keep the kids, I'm taking her to ER. Her heart was not doing good. And they ended up, to make a long story short, having to shock her heart to get everything back into place. And everything went totally normal during that shock. 
but she has had some more issues and they are trying to get her in to see a cardiologist. So just keep her in your continued prayers. Thank you. Count on that. The Lord is good all the time. All the time. Any, any other prayer requests or praises? I have one. Okay. So <clears throat> thank you for all your prayers. For, uh, I had an interview for an issue last week. Um, I found out that six weeks ago they cleared me of the misconduct against a minor. So I was clear of that. So praise the Lord for that. Of course, they didn't tell me that till my other interview that I have. I still need pray f prayer for that. Um, you know, I have an individual at my office that is just, just going after me just, just because he doesn't like me. So I still need prayer for that, um, that I'll prevail through that too and stuff. But that was a, a heavy weight that was lifted when uh, she told me that that case was closed February 15th of this year. And they just told me Wednesday of last week. And uh, so that, that was a lot of stress. My attorney didn't know about it. Myself didn't know about it. Um, but the good news is, is that I was clear of that because that was a, a heavy burden over me. And, you know, I, I had doubts. And with you guys' prayers and that kind of stuff, uh, it helped me get through it and stuff like that. So um, I was just glad that this is over. Now I just have to deal with the next step with this individual at my office. Um, that hopefully this will be the end of it, and he will stop harassing me on stuff. So, okay, thank you for sharing that. Anyone else? No, one. Okay. I am Renee Portillo, and um, we just want to thank everyone for always being so welcoming to us. We're, we're not great at attending every weekend. Uh, my dad is, but um, I just I just want to applaud all of you for your vulnerability with each other and just how warm and welcoming it is here. And um, we, my husband and I, we're trying to move out here. We finally sold our house in Colorado. Feel, thank you, God. And. Um, Grandpa's going to be watching the twins this week while my husband and I go back to Colorado, so please send prayers his way for dealing with two 14-year-olds. <laughs> and also with us traveling um, back and forth, we're going to be bringing back our oldest son, so uh, prayers have been answered. I, it's nice having all your kids together. So thank you again, and happy Easter. Thanks for sharing that. Isn't this a great family? Jesus. Great family. If there's... Any more before we move on? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, you knew what these requests were before they were voiced, and we lift them up to you right now. We ask, Lord, that you would intervene in these situations that involve people's health and welfare and emotions. What a wonderful God we serve, Lord, knowing that we can turn these things over to you and have peace after doing it. Lord, we ask that you would bless the music and the messages it's given this morning, that hearts would be prepared to receive it, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He is a good God. Amen. Do you know him? Do you know our Jesus? Let's stand if you're able and just join us in just worshiping our Jesus. Come now, fount of every blessing To my heart to sing thy praise Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious song that sung by flaming tongues of God. Praise the mountain, praise the pond, mount of thy redeeming love. I was lost in utter darkness till you came and rescued me. I was bound by all my sin when your love came and set me free. Now my soul can sing a new song. Now my heart has found a home. Now your 
a good God. Amen. Amen. Oh. The King of Kings. He is Lord of Lords. Amen. He is our hope. He is our trust. And he's worthy of our praise. In the darkness we were waiting, without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes. To fulfill the law and prophets, to a virgin came the one, from a throne of endless glory, to a cradle in the turf. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. 
Anybody need a pen? Our superstar Jason has a bucket of pens. Please raise your hand if you want to use a pen to fill in the outline, which every single person should be doing. I brought this pen to remind me to get you pens. Bucket of pens going around the room. We can almost just keep it like this and eat every week. I'm getting more amens on that than anything I've ever preached. Man, happy Easter, y'all. So glad y'all are here. Today we're all going to take a little walk together down the road to nowhere. Okay. Last week we looked at uh, Jesus' journey between the Sundays, between Palm Sunday and his resurrection. You know, those were two great victories, weren't they? He, he rolls into town on the young donkey, fulfilling the Old Testament scripture, being hailed as the king. And then a week later he is uh, the victor over death, the greatest victory ever. But what did he do in between? We looked at that. If you missed it, you can go to YouTube, search for Nutrioso Bible Church. What he did was he paid for our salvation. He paid the cost. He paid the price. Um, and what I talked about last week was what are we doing between the Sundays, right? So number one in your outline, we should start every day comparing what we do between the Sundays to what he did for us. What he did for us. Because he, you know, his journey led to the most important event in human history, which is what we are celebrating today, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why we have a future. That's why we have a plan. That's why I got reservations. That's why we have a hope. 
that other people don't have. The rest of the world does not have the same hope that we have in Christ. So number two in your outline, the resurrection of Jesus changed everything. Everything. See, he died for us. He paid that price. But it's the resurrection that changed everything. Lots of gods have died. Man has served all kinds of gods. And they're all dead, except for Jesus Christ. That's what set him apart from everybody else. So today we're going to go down this little road to nowhere together. Uh, I want to spend some time in the book of Luke, chapter 24. We're going to start out by taking a quick look at the empty tomb. Then we'll go down that road together and see how Jesus changed the destination for some folks. And he can do the same thing for you, no matter what kind of road you are on today. So Luke 24, verse 1. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. Now, in Jewish culture that day, that's what they did for the dead. They didn't embalm them. They took spices and sometimes perfumes, and they did really accomplished two big goals. One was to honor the dead, whoever it was that died, that they loved or respected, and the other was to mask the odor of the decomposing body. That's why they did that. Uh, but there's an important thing that we need to make sure we see there, and it's number three in your outline, the fact that the women in Luke 24 were taking spices to Jesus' tomb proves that they believed that he was dead. They believed he was dead. They really did. I mean, they saw everything that happened over that week before. They saw the, the uh, beatings, the floggings. They saw him nailed to the cross. They saw him die. They literally saw him die, and they thought that was it. Imagine their surprise in verses 2 and 3. It says they found that stone rolled away from the tomb. That tomb, by the way, was sealed and had armed Roman guard um, on it. But they found the stone rolled away. When they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. This had to blow their minds. They had to be just amazed, right? But I think probably what really blew their minds is what happened next. In verse 4, while they were wondering about this, Suddenly, two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. Can you imagine that? Would that blow your mind a little bit if all of a sudden two dudes are standing there in clothes that gleamed like lightning? It says, in their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? Why do you look for the living among the dead? Now, I've preached on that very sentence before. Why? Because I think far too often that's what we do. We look for life in the wrong places, don't we? We look for life in death. I mean, I'll tell you right now, I, from personal experience, I can promise you, you're not going to find life in that bottle. I looked. It ain't there. You won't find life in that baggie of cocaine. I know for a fact it ain't there. Bad relationships, porn, you're not going to find it there either. Dragging the baggage of your past around with you year after year after year after year. That's not living, guys. That's not living. You're going to find life there. That is literally the road to nowhere. Why do you look for the living among the dead? I really believe that little sentence right there is pointed directly at me. I think when God wrote it, he was writing it to me. I am bet he wrote it to a few of y'all too. Why do you look for the living among the dead? You know, Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus. It's the only way. You're not going to find Jesus in that bottle. I looked, he ain't there. Number four in your outline, don't look for life among the dead. Don't look for life among the dead. The men said to these women, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Kim was saying on the way in this morning, what would that have been like if you were there? Walking in, you walk in the tomb, and there's no Jesus. And then these dudes are standing there. He's not here. He's risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners be crucified on the third day and be raised again. Then they remembered his words. Then they remembered. What, man, would it have been crazy to be there? He's not here. He's risen. 
But that's the human condition, isn't it? I mean, Jesus told these people, including the women who went to the tomb, exactly what was going to happen. Multiple times he told them what was going to happen, and then it happened, right? But they don't get it. Their minds are blown. It said they were wondering what was going on, right? The Son of God. They've been with him for three years. They saw the miracles. They heard the teaching one-on-one. -on -one. He touched them in a way that only God could touch them. He told them, this is what's going to happen. And then it happened, but they didn't get it. They couldn't connect the dots. They couldn't, couldn't get past their humanness, right? They couldn't get past the limits of their mind and see what was outside of that, what was possible. But Jesus himself said in Matthew 19, 26, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. All things. But his followers, his disciples, could not see that. So here's a piece of advice. Number five in your outline. Don't wait for two men in clothes that shine like lightning to help you remember what Jesus said. Right here it is. Get in it every day. Anybody ever heard me tell you that? Every day. Make time every day. Don't wait till the angels are standing there with you to remind you what he said. Get in the book every day so you don't forget. Let's pick it back up in verse 9. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and all the others. Now, this is, this is really cool. All the disciples, all the followers are locked in a room. You know, they saw Jesus die, and they thought the same people were going to come and get them. But here come these women. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. I'm betting they did sound a little wacko. After seeing what they saw, I bet you they were talking over each other. I bet they were excited. I bet they were just stumbling around. And, and, and these guys were like, what are you smoking, man? You know, I mean, you're not making any sense to me. They couldn't get past the limits of their own mind. Verse 12, Peter, however, as my boy, Peter, just so, we, just so we're clear, right? That's my guy. Peter got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away. What was he doing? Same thing the ladies were doing, wondering to himself what had happened. All the followers are just like, what's going on here, right? So that's the accounting that Luke gives us of the empty tomb. Meanwhile, let's see what he says that Jesus is doing. Verse 13. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. We're going to pause there. We want to make sure we make a note of that. Seven miles from Jerusalem. That's an important number in the Bible. Seven days God created the heavens and the earth. Seven times the Israelites circled the walls of Jericho before they crumbled. There's seven churches, seven spirits, seven stars, seven seals, seven vials in the book of Re Revelation. See, the, in the Bible, the number seven, it stands for perfection, completion, maturation. Was the fact that Emmaus was seven miles from Jerusalem a coincidence? Because i got to tell you, you know, the more I dig into the Bible, the more coincidences I find, you know? I mean, the percentage has got to be off the chart on the coincidence factor, right? It's not a coincidence. God wrote it. It's perfect. The fact that that little insignificant village was seven miles away, I promise you that's where God put it. He put it there because the, the journey these people were going to take was going to end up being perfect. It's going to end up completed. You'll see what I mean. Verse 14. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. Now, I just wonder what that conversation was like because I promise you that week in Jerusalem, everybody knew what was going on. Everybody knew what was happening to Jesus. Paparazzi were out. Everybody had their phones. It was on every social network. He was going viral. Jesus was everywhere. Everybody knew what was going on in Jerusalem for that week before. So these guys are walking along, right? And they've been following Jesus. And they're, he is the center of their lives, everything that they know and think. Now he's dead. Their life must be crashing around, and they're thinking, oh, my goodness, I don't know what we're going to do next. I thought he was the Messiah, right? 
but I saw him killed firsthand. They're confused, they're disillusioned, they're bummed out. They loved him, and now he's dead, right? So that conversation must have been a real exciting one, I'm sure, right? Continuing in verse 15, as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. We don't know why they were kept from recognizing him, but that's interesting that they didn't know who he was. See, according to Luke's account of the resurrection of Jesus, it was on that same day that he shows up on the road to nowhere with these people. I think that's interesting. Why am I calling it the road to nowhere? Well, because Emmaus no longer exists. In fact, they don't even know exactly where it was. Okay, seven miles from Jerusalem, but they don't know exactly where it was. It's an insignificant little village, and it's disappeared in time. Emmaus is literally nowhere. And then on top of that, these two people maybe are kind of on the road to nowhere in their lives a little bit. Not sure what to do. Jesus is dead. Can't see past the limits of their own mind to see what's possible. Scripture says that Jesus showed up for them on the road to nowhere. And he'll show up for you too. Number six in your outline, Jesus will show up on your road to nowhere. But he won't leave you there. He won't leave you there. He didn't leave these people there either. Continuing in verse 17, he asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? I think that's funny. Don't we think that's funny? I mean, he's God. He's like, hey, hey, guys, how's it going? Um, what are you talking about? He knew. He knew exactly what they were talking about, but he wanted them to play this string out. That's what he wanted. They stood still, their faces downcast. That's interesting, because they're walking along the path. Jesus shows up, asks them, what are you talking about? And they stop. They must have stopped right in their tracks. And their faces were downcast. Like all of his followers, these two were bummed out. They're bummed out. They don't know what they're going to do, right? And just to make sure we don't miss an opportunity to connect a couple dots here, number seven in your outline, while they didn't recognize Jesus, they were bummed out. Connect those dots. It's while they did not know who he was. Their faces were downcast. Let's look at verse 18. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Dude, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there these days? Again, everybody knew. Anybody with a Facebook account saw what was going on, right? Twitter had it. Instagram had it. Snapchat had it. It was everywhere. Cleopas is like, well, you didn't see it? Jesus says, what things? What things? He says about Jesus of Nazareth. He was a prophet. He was a prophet. See, he's referring to Jesus in the past tense, isn't he? Because their human minds were just unable to get outside of what they saw as possible. Their human minds were stuck in what was and couldn't get to what is. Ever been there? I promise you, you have. It's just the human condition. Number eight in your outline, don't let what was keep you from what is God's plan for your life. You hear what I'm saying to you? Don't let what's happened stop you from doing what he wants you to do, being who he wants you to be, fulfilling the promise he has for your life. What things, he asked? About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word. Indeed, before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. We had hoped. We had hoped. <laughs> See, we, we hoped he was the guy, right? But it didn't work out that way. So what do they got? They got a hat in front of their hope. Think about that a minute. It didn't go the way they thought, so now they got a had in front of their hope. See, I had hoped I'd get that job. I needed that job. I was the best one. I was qualified. I had all the experience, perfect attendance. 
you know, seniority, all that stuff. I had hoped I'd get that job, but I didn't get it. I didn't get the job, right? I had hoped my medical report would be different. I'd hoped that person that I love would have beat cancer and still be here today. I had hoped that that relationship was the one. He was the one or she was the one. But it didn't work out that way. Now I got a hat in front of my hope. Number nine in your outline, your sound bite for the week. Don't let the world put a hat in front of your hope. Don't let the world do it. Because it will. They said, but we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. See, again, in the Jewish culture of the day, they believed that the soul could return to the body. But only the first three days. Only the first three days. See, it was kind of like they had a, an expiration date. Somebody put a little sticker on them. You know, don't they, don't you think they had to make expiration dates easier to find? My goodness, man, it's hard to find them. With Jesus, it was easy. They were looking at the calendar. He had an expiration date. Everybody then did. They believed the soul could come back, but only the first three days. So now that expiration day date had, had expired. They believed Jesus had reached his expiration date. Do you think that this meeting on the road to nowhere, just after Jesus' expiration date expired, is a coincidence? Or do you, th I mean, it's like I say, there's a lot of coincidences in the Bible, right? Or do you think God planned it that way? Do you think God wrote it that way? Do you think God made it happen that way for a reason? Seven miles, right? Just after his expiration day, I promise you it's not a coincidence. It's a God thing. You can take it to the bank. Number 10 in your outline, there is no expiration date on the power of God. Now, there's an expiration date on your opportunity to accept Jesus, I want to make sure we're clear. You all got an expiration date. You've got to accept Jesus before you leave this place. But there's no expiration date on the power of God. Never. This Cleopas guy, he's, he's saying that all hope is lost, right? The great prophet was dead, and that's that. It's over. It's done. Finished. Verse 22. In addition, some of our women amazed us. Now, we're going to pause and get off the track for a minute because some of our women here amaze me. Was the food good this morning? Was, was it great? Thank you, Heidi, our fearless leader, and the entire group. We had a team come in yesterday to set everything up, and, and uh, I know I have to clean it all up myself, but other than that, these, listen, I'm going to tell you, this church family amazes me, not just the women. This church family amazes me. And as much as you people amaze me, and you do, trust me, my wife amazes me even more. I got a good one, boy. I'll tell you what, I got a good one. I do. I married up. I outkicked my coverage, right? In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they did not find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. Do you see the irony here? <laughs> These people are standing there talking to Jesus. And they're talking about somebody who don't see Jesus. And they don't know it's Jesus. Do we do that? Come on, think about it. Sometimes you think you're talking to Jesus. Maybe you're talking to yourself. Maybe you're giving him, telling him what it's going to be. We've talked about that in our prayer series, right? You can't make a deal with God. Can't do it. I just thought it was ironic. They're talking about people who couldn't see Jesus. So the table is set. We've got two of his followers here. They're really bummed out. They're on the road to nowhere. Jesus shows up. They don't know who he is. Verse 25. He said to them, how foolish you are. How slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. See, because everything Jesus did was foretold in Old Testament Scripture. And these guys knew the Old Testament Scripture. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? Now, the Greek word he used for glory here is doxa. It actually means the awesome light 
that radiates from God's presence and is associated with his acts of power. Again, everything he did was foretold. And now he's reminding these guys, you're forgetting everything you've grown up knowing out of the Old Testament. Verse 27 says, in beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all scriptures concerning himself. Did you notice something that he said there that Jesus said in verse 26? He said, did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? There's an order to this. He suffered it for us, and then he entered his glory. You know, Jesus taught about his, uh, this stuff before his crucifixion ever happened. Let's see what he said in John 14, 28 and 29. He said, you heard me say, I am going away, and I am coming back to you. If you love me, you'd be glad that I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now, before it happens, so that when it does happen, you'll believe. Got thousands of years of this in the Bible. Jesus comes and fulfills all of it. They told us about it. God told us about it before it happened. Number 11 in your outline, the Bible foretold of all Jesus would do for thousands of years so that when he did it, we would believe in him. That was the plan. And now it happened. And they still don't get it, right? Jesus is standing there with them on the road to nowhere and he didn't leave them there, but they don't, they don't understand what's going on. So what happens next? Verse 28 and 29, as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. So I think there's three important things here in these two verses that I want to make sure we see says Jesus continued on. So see, Jesus didn't force himself on him. He didn't plant himself in there. You know, he didn't say, bam, you will do this. He continued on. He left it up to them to take action. And they did. They invited him in. And because they did, he stayed with them. It works the same way with us. It works the same with, way with you. you. You know, Jesus is not going to... There's going to be a day... When every knee shall bow. But until that day, you have a choice. You have an option. Invite him in. Got to accept him. Got to have him in your heart of hearts. Jesus got to be your one and only Lord and Savior. If he is, he won't forsake you. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 32 and 33, Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. Isn't that going to be the day right there? When Jesus acknowledges you to the Father. But guess what? He also said, but whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Number 12 in your outline, Jesus won't leave you where he finds you or refuse you when you invite him into your heart. Some people teach a different doctrine. I stand here today and tell you, you have a choice to make. You have a role in that relationship. It's all over the Bible. It's all through the Bible. You have free will. He gives you free will. Expiration date, you bet there is. When you leave this earth, that's your expiration date. You better make your choice between now and then. If you open up your heart like they opened up their home, he won't refuse you. What happens next? Verse 30. When he was at the table with them, he took bread and gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. You know, at the Last Supper, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, handed it to the disciples. I kind of almost look at this as the First Supper. You know what I mean? As far as I can tell, it's the first one after his resurrection. And what's he doing? Same thing he did at the Last Supper. He's breaking bread, he's giving thanks, and he's handing it out. I just wonder if when he did that, they saw his scars. Maybe they just saw his scars. They saw where he was nailed to that cross. And it brought them out of their fog. They realized who they were talking to. Maybe it's as simple as that. See, his scars probably just brought them home. Right then and there. You and I have got scars, don't we? We've all got scars. I promise you this. 
There's a purpose to every single one of your scars. God allows everything for the, for the good of those who love him. Everything. There's a purpose for every tear you've ever shed. Every one. In, in Psalm 56, 8, King David says to God, You keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected all my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. Now, come on now. If that doesn't encourage you today, I don't know what will. God is actually putting your tears in his bottle, recording each one of them in his book. That's crazy. He wouldn't collect your tears. He wouldn't record them if they didn't matter. Back to Luke 24, verse 32. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? And you know what I say? You're dang skippy. He's Jesus. Of course your hearts were burning within you. Number 13 in your outline. When you get Jesus, I mean really get Jesus, you're going to feel him in your heart. You're going to know he's there. You're not going to have to wonder about it. It'll change you forever. Let's finish up this passage with verses 33 through 35. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord is risen and has appeared to Simon. So see, Jesus is appearing to Simon and he's appearing to these two people on the road to nowhere. Can you say God? Because it's, it's God, right? Verse 35, Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. See, these two people, they left Jerusalem discouraged. They left Jerusalem lost. They were traveling down the road to nowhere, and what did they find? They found Jesus. And, and guess what? They returned to Jerusalem redeemed. They're redeemed. See, Jesus didn't just change human history when he died on that cross and rose again. He didn't just change human history. You have the opportunity to change your future. Not just here but for eternity see god sent his son to die for us and when he did that and he rose again he literally changed my destination changed my destination you bet i was on the road to nowhere there's not any doubt about that jesus made that promise in john 14 1 through 4 he says you believe in god believe also in me my father's house has many rooms if that were not so what i have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. Now, I can't speak. I think Skip was right. I think we got 63 people. I can't speak for you guys. But I can speak for me, and I'll tell you this right now. I cannot wait to see the place he's preparing for me. My goodness, what a day that's going to be. I'm going to run like a deer. You know, I'm going to, my back ain't going to hurt. My knees aren't going to be bummed anymore. It's go, I'm going to be good looking. I mean, I can't wait to get there. I want him to take me with him. With him. I want to spend eternity where he is. You see, there's only one way to get there. Jesus. There's only one way to get there. There's only one risen God. Only one. The rest of them are all dead because they were never gods in the first place. Father, thank you for the time we've had in your house today as your family, your church family. Thank you for your son. Thank you for the sacrifice he made for us, for the blood spilt for us, for the broken body, for the grace that you make available to us, for the opportunity we have to have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with you, Lord. We just thank you for that. Lord, I pray as each of us go out this week, we'll remember what you did for us. Compare how we walk, how we act, how we live with how you did. Compare ourselves to you. If we could just be more like you. We love you and we thank you for all the blessings you give us here in the Trioso Bible Church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Everybody stand up and sing. And if you want prayer, come on up. Oh, no.
Celebration of life for Mr. Charles Blair this Saturday at 11 o'clock here at the church. Um, if you guys want to come, come on up. What a great man he was. I'm going to miss him. He was awesome. Um, but we're going to celebrate his life with his family this Saturday. So come on up if you can. And as you walk through this week, again, why don't you just look at what you're doing every day and compare it to what he did. I mean, that, that should be the bar, right? Love you guys. Amen. Let's Here's go the last out. song. Let's go out with He Lives. I serve the risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He is living. Whatever that we say, I see His hand of mercy. I hear His voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along my narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to him all. You ask me how I go.